First, thanks for the um, kind introduction and for the hospitality from Raoul and Maxi, who have been very kind to us in the last couple of days. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, opinion formation and influence maximization on social networks. So really the focus is on influence maximization, and I'll explain what I mean by that um, in a couple of slides. Um, just to start by acknowledging a number of my PhD students um, and some lectures I've worked with on, on this topic. Um, I apologize because some names are spelled wrongly, unfortunately. <laughs> but to say a couple of words about the motivation for the work, um, this is currently funded by the Alan Turing Institute, and our motivation was that there really have been a couple of incidents in the past which have been fairly well documented, where um, on social media um, external powers have interfered in democratic processes. So there are some well-known cases like the um, elections in, in 2016 in the US. Um, this is very well documented, so there's a number of big reports about this now um, that really go into detail into the manipulation that happened on social media at the time. Um, there are questions about what happened, so I'm based in the UK at the moment, um, what happened in the Brexit referendum as well. Um, there's a couple of other cases where um, in recent years, people have looked at um, interference, mostly of Russian um, social media um, agents, and have documented what, what happened there. And this is really not such a surprise, because social media are, amongst the younger generation are much more present nowadays, um, and many more people engage there. Um, that gives a huge source of data, and it gives a fairly cheap and efficient way for um, people who want to manipulate on, on social networks. No? So the kind of questions that I'm interested in are questions on how does that happen, how can we prevent that, no? and, and how can we optimally prevent that. So part of my talk is um, looking at optimization in, in the sense of how can we spread, um, let's say, the propagation of fake news, if you like, but also to look at the, the game theoretical scenario where we say, okay, we have competition happening on a social network where two actors, let's say, have slightly different goals and they're trying to manipulate the system for their respective goals. Yeah, so this is kind of the big picture. I go into much more abstract and nitty-gritty models in a second, and you probably won't see the connection anymore. Right. Um, so this is the agenda of things that I want to talk about today. So I'll give you a brief introduction. Probably most people here in the setting know about these underlying models anyway. So I'll talk a bit about influence maximization. I'm based in computer science nowadays. Um, 
There is a large literature in computer science on influence maximization, probably not so familiar with the setting here, so I'll explain a bit what has been done there. Um, but I'm really interested in the Rotor model, so I'll say a couple of, so my talk is really on how can you translate <coughs> what has been done in terms of influence maximization in computer science to the models that are more of interest um, to the physicists, um, to models like the voting dynamics. Um, and I look at two things in the voting dynamics where in contrast to previous work, um, I have slightly different results that point out um, that really um, some simple heuristics that um, are typically used um, don't necessarily work in all cases. So one case I want to look at is um, the effect of noise in the voting dynamics and the other, um, sorry, I think I have the wrong version of my slides, but I go with these ones. There's some minor differences in there. <laughs> because I probably won't talk about the effect of time horizons, but I'll talk about the effects of um, continuous um, optimization. So what is typically being done in the computer science literature is um, a look at the discrete scenario where you say um, influence can either be there or it cannot be there, whereas what we are doing here is we are looking at um, graduated notions of influence, where there can be a bit of influence and maybe a bit more of influence. I'm also be quite interested in the continuous scenario, and if there's time, I might talk about the um, effects of time horizons um, towards the end of my talk, yeah. and finish with some conclusions. So to just um, introduce the problem setting, so what I'm interested in is we have a social network, there's some contagion process, some spreading process of opinions, going on, of attitudes going on on social networks, so let's presume that agents just have two binary states, we could say, they're either um, in favor of something, or let's say um, against some issue, um, some contagion dynamics going on, but we also have external influence. And external influence um, is maybe one passive agent who um, just has a fixed allocation of his influence, um, and maybe one active agent who actively tries to allocate his influence in such a way as to drive the system into a desired state. Yeah? Um, this is a typical setting. I'll explain in more detail um, how I make this more precise um, um, as a mathematical framework. But I mean, you can see that um, application areas here are not really only about foreign influence necessarily, but this is generally a problem that's interest, of interest to marketing in general, if you think about innovations, um, if you think about pushing your products and um, convincing people that they should buy your products. Um, but also, um, if you think about um, campaigns of the government, or if you think about political campaigns, um, then um, this scenario is clearly of interest. You have um, various parties interested there that want to push the system into a certain direction, and they have a final budget, and they have to decide somehow how to allocate this budget um, over the network. Yeah? Um, now, let me say a couple of words what has been done on this problem traditionally in the computer sciences. So this goes back to um, famous papers from 2003, around 2003, by um, Duncan Watts. Um, and he came up with, um, or he did the first work on what's called the independent cascade model. So this is basically a population type model. Imagine that initially in your system, all of the nodes are in a neutral state. You distribute um, a number of seeds of nodes that are in favor of your idea or your product. Um, and then from these nodes, um, a one-off cascading process um, starts through the network where um, all the neighbors are infected with a given probability. Right? As soon as the cascade runs dry, the process is finished, um, we're at the end of the process. And what we are interested in, or what the computer science literature is interested in, is the question how to optimally distribute the seed nodes in the first place in order to maximize the size of the cascade that you get. Um, as I said, so um, there's a lot of work on this problem, mostly on the algorithmic side of it. So people are very interested in finding algorithms um, that manage to solve this optimization problem for very large networks um, to be used in practical applications in advertising, basically. Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of potential problems with this type of model when you think about, let's say, the political scenario that I outlined in the beginning. So people don't necessarily commit to one opinion forever, like it is assumed in this model, but people typically tend to be influenced continuously by their peers, and there might be a certain chance that you change your opinion. So what I'm interested in is um, dynamic models that are not a one-off contagion process, but models that allow for stochastic dynamics of flipping of opinions over time, and you might want to, let's say, look at the stationary state of this process. Um, 
So as I said, so the slide just repeats this basically on the independent cascade model might be a good model if you want to model influence maximization in a setting where there's strong commitment to the decision that you have made. Also, if you, for instance, um, want to buy a car, you are unlikely to change your mind and then buy another car very quickly afterwards and change the model of the car. Um, if you're thinking about buying a cheaper product like a toothbrush, or if you're thinking about political opinions, um, there's typically not such a strong commitment, so people can change and enforce more easily. Um, so this model might not be the model that we might be interested in. So to say something about the state of the literature, um, in computer science, um, this um, optimization problem has been looked at a lot, but typically not in the setting of a progressive model, of a dynamic model that allows for continuous change of opinions over time. There's a bit of work on this, um, and I'll talk about some of this in a bit. So um, what we need in order to formalize this model is we need to somehow have a model for how agents change their opinions over time. And there's quite a large literature in social physics or in physics, if you like. Um, some people here in the room have contributed to this literature quite a lot. Um, we have to basically specify this model in some way. And there are many choices how we could do this. Yeah? So I won't really spend a lot of time in, um, telling you what models are out there. So at the basic level, we might distinguish do we want to model opinions as continuous or do we want to model them as some binary variables. And then at a fundamental level, we have to make a choice if you have curvature in the model or if you don't have curvature in the model. Um, the choice of model that I've made here um, is I've based my research, research on the voting dynamics, which maybe is not even the most appropriate model to um, realistically model um, a social spreading process because it doesn't have what's called complex contagion. So it's basically just a simple copying process that you copy it randomly the state of randomly selected neighbors. Um, but it is a nice generalization, I would say, of the independent cascade model. Um, and it allows for some analytical treatment quite easily. So it's a natural starting point to look at these issues. Yeah, so the goal of the research in the future is certainly to take what we have done here so far towards more realistic models of opinion formation. OK. So, um, just for those of you who have not heard about the voter models, I don't think this is anybody in the room, so I'll be very quick about this. Um, so the voting dynamics, um, what we're talking about is basically a very simple process. Um, it's an iterative process. Imagine we um, select a node at random at every <coughs> point in time in this process. Um, from that node, we randomly select one of the neighbors of that node, and we just copy the state of that neighbor. Yeah? And we iterate this um, process until we reach a mistake. So this model has been very well studied in statistical physics. There's um, a lot of work on this model. Um, I won't really go into detail about this. Um, I'll tell you um, how in 2015, um, another person, Naoki Masuda, um, modified this model slightly um, to formalize that um, as an influence maximization problem. So what um, Masuda did at the time is he basically said, OK, let's suppose we have um, a passive opponent in there who just makes a random allocation of influence and who propagates an um, opinion, let's say, B, the blue opinion on my slide here. What I'm interested in is um, the red um, actor. And the red actor also has a certain budget, so has a number of connections of influence that you can distribute unilateral influence towards the system. You like both of these guys are silots, um, so they basically always stick to their opinion. And the optimization problem is that the red guy basically wants to optimally select a number of nodes in the system to target in order to push the, in this case, mixed equilibrium state as far as possible in the direction of his own opinion. Yeah? Um, so Masuda sort of called the Sigurd, in this case, opinion controller. So strictly speaking, probably it's not opinion controller. But he came up with a number of very interesting results there. Yeah? basically formalize this problem, it turns out it's a problem of just applying linear algebra in the end, because all of these equations um, are linear. Um, and more or less, um, he showed what are the modes that you would target. Well, I mean, probably your intuition tells you what you should target. You should more or less go for the hard modes, yeah, if you have a heterogeneous network. And there are some differences to this. Um, so under some conditions, you would have some other modes in there as well, but more or less broadly, um, you would mostly favor in targeting hard nodes. Yeah? So this is what I want to take further. And, um, this is the framework that I'm using for what I'm doing. And I want to look at a couple of scenarios where I modify the model slightly. 
and talk about what happens in these scenarios and see if the simple and very intuitive heuristic to just target all of the hub modes um, will work in these situations or probably won't work in these situations. Um, that's the idea. So this is a list of some situations that we have looked at and I'll give answers um, to some of these situations but I won't really talk in detail about all of them. So starting from this work by Masuda, there are some obvious questions on what is going to happen if you modify um, the model slightly. Yeah, so what is going to happen, for instance, if instead of just taking the voting dynamics, what about if you make the voting dynamics noisy and you um, include a certain amount of noise in it? Yeah, or um, another question um, of interest is, in the setting of Masuda, um, agents are um, different in terms of their topological position in the network, but in terms of their intrinsic characteristics, they are all the same. Right, that they all have the same susceptibility to adopt the opinions of neighbors. What about if we include some agents that are maybe a bit more stubborn or have a certain bias in the population? Yeah, so how would that modify the existing results? Um, next question, what about continuous allocations? So, so far I've presented that problem as um, you just in a binary way, you target nodes or you don't target nodes. But what about if you can um, have a gradual um, amount or graduated amount of influence in the nodes? Does that change um, the nature of the results? And does that change um, the basic heuristic of maybe targeting hub nodes? Um, yeah, so the other setting um, that I moderated in the beginning of my introduction, what about the game theory? Yeah, so, so far in Masuda's work, I've only said, okay, we have a passive opponent and we optimize against the passive opponent. But what about if both um, agents simultaneously want to optimize what are equilibrium um, situations or uh, solutions in a game theoretical sense. Yeah? Or the last question that um, I might not come to in the talk, um, the question, Masuda's work is based on equilibrium assumptions, so basically um, trying to influence the equilibrium state of the voting dynamics, um, which with influence um, from the outside is a mixed equilibrium state. What about if you don't, if you can't wait until equilibrium, what about if you have to make decisions before? What about if our vote, um, let's say, takes place after a certain time horizon t, which is short in comparison to the time that is needed in order to get to the equilibrium state of the system? <coughs> and so all of these um, slight modifications of the original question, what we're interested in is, um, does the heuristic of targeting hub nodes stand as before, or can we come up with alternative heuristics and alternative guidelines? Um, how you should um, optimally influence the system. Yeah? Okay, so let me move on to the situation with noise and just um, give you a couple of um, ideas of how we formalize that problem. So it's basically a um, very simple application of rate equations here. So what we are doing is I introduce um, a variable, what's the probability for a node to be in a certain state. The state can be A or B or plus or minus if you like. Um, I have an adjacency matrix of my network here. This may be a weighted matrix um, or a pure adjacency matrix, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I define this vector um, PI here. And the vector PI basically gives me the influence of a node um, or of the controller that is influenced on a node. Yeah, and then what I do here is I just write down um, a differential equation for the probability of the node to be in the state 1. Yeah, what we see from this equation here is we basically have, um, so this is for the situation with noise. Um, we have one part of the equation um, which is just the normal voting dynamics and we have one part of the equation that basically reflects the noise term. Yeah? Um, right. uh, like P of i is asymmetric, it's only in the, in the first and not in the second. Yes, so, so what I did here, so I, I'm hiding part of the truth for this equation from you, so I should explain um, better. So here, um, what I did is we have only one controller. So we only have this um, one external controller who is basically fighting against um, the noise term in the network. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, what we can do, so this is um, a normal equation um, at first sight, but um, it's a bit of manipulation. You see easily that the nonlinear terms come out. So the equilibrium condition turns out to be just a linear equation. So I can just formalize what the, um, you know, what the, um, condition, the linear condition is for finding the equilibrium states. Um, I'm interested in the sum of these um, stationary probabilities for the um, system to be in a certain state. Yeah. Now the question is somewhat computationally, if I want to do this for a large network, how do I invert the system? 
Um, there are iteration methods how to do this quickly. So this all goes back still to Masuda, who has basically said, told in his paper how to do this. Yeah? But this is the framework we're using. The optimization problem is we want to maximize the vote share for um, a given um, adjacency matrix, for um, a given amount of noise, um, and for um, so basically we want to find the um, optimal control is P. Yeah. So this is the problem we want to solve. Um, I first start with the problem in binary setting. So in the binary setting, um, in the term of, of trying to use um, optimization techniques, I'm using um, here a simple um, stochastic hill climb one. One could think about um, a version of simulated leading or something like this as well. I move on then to the continuous setting where um, the choice of techniques is a bit more natural. We have um, quicker techniques with um, better guarantees to find optimal solutions. Yeah, so this is what we have done. So let me show you um, some examples of some outcomes and then I'll try to explain why um, things change in this setting. Yeah, so here I give you two pictures of networks um, for which we have tried to optimize the influence. Um, not sure if you can see it very well, but I've basically colored the nodes with a color that indicates um, their opinion state. And if the node is in a darker color, that indicates that the node is more aligned with my goal of the optimizer, whereas if the node is in a um, whiter color, that indicates the node is in the opponent state, more likely to be in the opposition state. Um, the red um, boxes indicate what are the optimal nodes to be targeted. Yeah, so, um, and the one figure corresponds to the situation with little noise in the voting dynamics, and the right-hand situation corresponds to the situation with more noise in the voting dynamics. You see quite a difference here. So first, um, you see a difference in terms of the shading of the nodes, yeah, because clearly on the left-hand side, the um, nodes have a grayer type of view. That means it's easier to influence the system. Yeah, so the system is more aligned with the goal of the optimizer because the noise is fairly low in the system, so it's easier to optimize. Um, in the right-hand side setting, it's hard to optimize. Um, so the typical node is um, fairly far away from the optimizer. Um, because the node is fairly wide. Yeah? So it's very hard to struggle against the noise in the system. Yeah? Um, you also see quite some difference in terms of the allocation of um, the optimal control. Yeah? So on the left-hand setting, with a bit of noise in the dynamics, you basically see that result um, from Masuda as well, that what are the nodes that you would target? You would target nodes that are at the center of the network. So basically, you target a selection of the hub nodes in the network. Whereas if you look at the right-hand side situation, you clearly see that the nodes that you should target are the nodes at the periphery of the network. Yeah. So you go for the low degree nodes, um, basically the lowest degree nodes in the set. Yeah. So that's quite some difference, basically stating, um, depending of, on the amount of noise in the voting dynamics, um, the optimal or the heuristic for the optimal solution changes quite dramatically from targeting hub nodes for um, relatively low amounts of noise in the system towards targeting periphery nodes for um, Larger amounts of noise in the system. Yeah. Okay, so um, is, is that strict? Are they really the, the most highly connected and the most lowly connected? No, so it is strictly. Yeah, so the most lowly connected is true in the setting, but here, in strictly, the most highly connected is not true. Yeah. So this is a heuristic. Um, it tends to be the nodes that have a higher degree, but this is not strictly the order. On um, Undirected networks it tends to align very well, and there's some differences in um, undirected networks. Uh, sorry, undirected networks. Can you tell me what the, what the gray? Yeah, so the gray color indicates. Is on the bottom node? Why do you mean? Yes, it is. So the gray color indicates the likelihood of a node to be in a state. Yeah, so gray, the darker the hue, the more likely. Okay, the so this is average for many realizations. So the greater the node, or the darker the node, the more likely the node is to be a node that is aligned with the opinion. And this was between minus one and one, I mean, average zero is... So um, here I say basically between zero and one, and then I average. So what is it on the, on the right hand side, you will go to the other side? Yeah, so on the right hand side, um, these are basically nodes that are not likely at all to be nodes that are in favor of me. And so these are nodes that are likely to be in state zero, in the opponent state. So, so in what sense, that's optimal? In what sense that's optimal? Most of the nodes are not aligned with the opinion that you intend. Yes, but I mean the, the optimum so the system is very hard to control. The best I can do uh, in terms of is, is to control a few nodes that does not have any other opinion to counterbalance that. 
Yes, so the best I can Yes, so the best I can able to control basically not that has two wings, you are only able to control to convince not that has one wing and that's the optimal because yes. you control the one that you fall. That's all you can do. That's what you can do. You do the mean times. It would be half the time on the black and half the time on the white, so that would be over five. Why? I mean, what does it do? No, if you have an appointment controller in it as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the opponent, you have a passive opponent who is in the system, yeah, and you, you push an active opponent against it. So, um, but, uh, sorry, another question. In, in this definition of optimal control, yes. uh, the point is, in what sense the fact that you just have a very small fraction of the node yes. uh, that follow your opinion, is understood as control. I mean, uh, 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 I, I understand control. I mean, when no, okay, so it's not, it's it's not optimal control in terms of controlling these nodes. Yes. Um, what I'm talking about is in, in the sense of pushing the stationary state of the system as far in my direction as I can. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. I don't control the majority of the system. But it's quite far away from the... From yes, it's very far away from being able to control the system, but it's the best I can do in the situation. Sorry, on the right, so there is one. So most of the nodes are in the opposite state, yes. opposite to the red one, right? Yes. And you say this is because there's an, an opposing controller somewhere in the middle, right? Is that correct? Or? Yes, so I noticed I got into a mess of explaining the model. <laughs> <laughs> so because um, this is a result that also holds for the noisy setting, but I've used a slide for um, a slight variation of the model, which I haven't motivated very well. So in this model, um, as I've used here, if you look at my equations for the stationary state, um, mm -hmm. I only have one controller, and I say um, nodes have a certain resistance to control. So instead of um, noisy flipping back and forth, um, if the nodes are the, in the controlled state, um, they have a certain probability of flipping back. Whereas if they are, they are in the opponent state, they don't flip back. I mean, in, in my state, they don't feel back. My like, question would be if, as an opposing yeah. controller, I can undo that effect by placing myself in a very similar position somehow, and then I neutralize that thing, right? Yes, you could. So you that, yes. If the two things are not, I did not exchangeable. Now, in, in this setting, you can show that um, the amount of resistance um, that I have just described is actually equivalent to the action of an opposing controller, who is passive. Yeah, but who allocates control in a certain way. Yeah, but I, I can talk to you through the details maybe later on, because... Yeah. Is it that the passive controller is globally coupled? And yes, so this is equivalent to a passive uh, controller that would be globally coupled. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 So sorry for not... So I guess over this. Yeah. There is a hypothesis here is that any the controller nodes I have the same influence as the other nodes. So it's they have the same, there is uh, no one that can influence more than the, than the, than the non-zero. I think this is important. Right? Uh, yes, yeah, so I look at scenarios like this later, so for my prototypical example here, this is not the case. No? So here in this case, um, if you formalize it as the opponent being a global control, um, the opponent can potentially have more force than you. So this is not balanced in the sense. No? So what I'm try to explain fairly badly, um, is that there is a difference between two regimes. So there's one regime where the opponent has um, a lot of force or there's a lot of noise in the system. No? Or and there's another regime where it's easy to control the system. In this case, if you can control the system, you should basically go for the other noise. OK, so I should have changed the slides. And it's really for the noise setting. Um, right, so we have tried to understand what's going on. So what what happens in this shift between the um, high noise to the um, low noise setting. And um, a way of um, just understanding why this um, targeting should go away from the hard nodes um, towards the periphery nodes is to look at just simple um, prototypical examples where you can fairly easily calculate what's going on. So we first had a look at star networks where um, you can just do it in mass very simply. It's just a very simple toy example. And on the star networks, um, you can quite easily see this transition where it happens. So you can quite easily see that um, you do the mass, um, that basically optimal control 
changes from allocate, being allocated to the um, hub nodes, um, then at some stage it switches to the periphery nodes. So this is a fairly simple example to see what's happening. But if you look at um, the equations here um, that we have derived for the simple case of star networks, you also see why um, it's difficult to control a hub node. And it's difficult because um, the hub node is surrounded by a lot of other nodes. And your, your control allocation is just one um, link amongst a lot of other links um, around that nodes. So what, what basically happens is it takes a long time until you conquer that hub node, which is not a problem in a station very often. But it's a problem if you have noise in the system that acts um, against it. Yeah, so you, at some stage, um, your attempt to conquer the hub node can't really, um, because you need a certain time to conquer that node, and in that time, the node has already been affected by the noise, um, roughly speaking. There's another effect in it um, that um, your control, if you have a noisy situation, um, kind of peters out as you get away from the controlled nodes. Yeah, so as you get farther away from the controlled nodes, the noise um, sort of acts as a friction along the links. So what you want to do is, on the one hand side, you want to allocate your control to the central node, because um, of the friction argument, it's easy to reach all the other nodes with limited resources quite easily, but um, it's also difficult to control the, the hub nodes, yeah? because um, it's difficult to counteract the noise. And as a balance between these two forces, um, the balance switches as you change the amount of noise in the system. So I come back to this issue in, in a bit because we've also um, looked at this um, in a slightly more general setting so we can actually also calculate something for the setting um, where we don't only have star networks. So this is just to motivate it. But um, for the case where we can calculate something analytically, we actually have looked at um, not the um, discrete binary situation, which was what I presented so far, where you target a node or you don't target a node, but for the situation where you can target nodes with different intensities. Yeah, so this is for the continuous um, inference maximization case. Yeah, well, so you just summarize um, the difference. So binary nodes target a lot. So here we have um, a certain budget, which is basically a number of nodes um, that you can influence. Now, in the continuous case, um, nodes can be influenced to certain extents. So we basically have this um, vector of PIs in my um, explanation before, which is a continuous variable now. Um, and the budget is just the sum over the PIs, which we um, require to be below a certain threshold amount um, and to be limited. Yeah. The continuous setting, in comparison to the discrete setting, also has a number of computational advantages. Also, in the discrete setting, I'm basically down to combinatorial optimization techniques. In the continuous setting, um, under certain um, constraints that we can show about the um, concavity of the problem, um, we can basically use techniques like um, slight modifications of gradient descent um, to solve that problem. So it's numerically quite easy to do. So, okay, to show you some of the things that are happening in the um, continuous setting, so I start by um, having a look at the situation where the B controller um, only targets one node. So the B controller is very sparse in the first setting. And I should just show you some numerical results about what's happening here. And this is a summary um, about what's happening on many types of different networks. So what's, uh, what's typically being um, plotted here is um, the amount of budget that is, in, um, is allocated to nodes as a function of these nodes from, uh, of the distance of these nodes from the B controller. Yeah? And you see, I mean, roughly this looks um, the same. So we have one situation where the um, budget of the B controller is larger than the budget of the A controller. And we have one situation where the budget of the active controller, the A controller, is larger than the budget of the B controller. And an interesting observation is, first of all, that um, the control is not local. So even so, you have only one component in here. You basically spread out your control more or less over the entire network. Next observation is, um, that looks to be almost the same um, if you look at these plots, but there's actually a small difference the difference is in do you target the node um, at the location that is controlled by the B controller or do you not target that node? And you see, in a situation where the budget of the B controller is larger than your own budget, you basically don't um, target the B controller node at all. So basically there's no allocation at zero here in all of these cases, in all of the networks that we have looked at. However, there is typically a strong allocation 
if your budget is larger than the budget of the B controller. Yeah? So you still, um, in a way, um, to formulate that as heuristics, what you're doing, if you have more budget than um, the opposing controller, you basically put a lot of budget on the node that the opposing controller tries to control, but you also ring fence with um, declining amounts um, as you get farther away from the um, <coughs> decontrolers targeting. Yeah? Whereas if you are um, budget inferior to the um, opposing controller, what you do is you um, avoid the opponent, uh, the um, op <coughs> node controlled by the opponent um, controller, but you try to ring fence and you ring fence by first putting a strong layer of influence around that node, but not only um, around that node directly, but also with a tail um, targeting nodes that are farther and farther away from the B controller. <coughs> so, um, in a way, how we have um, formulated this is um, as shielding or shadowing. Yeah? So, basically, you shadow if you are budget superior, and you only shield if you are budget inferior. Yeah? So, what we did is first we had a quick look at um, trying to understand um, why that is the case. And in order to understand why that is the case, we just built a very simple mean field model where we put nodes into three categories, essentially. So we said, OK, we have um, the nodes that are controlled by the B controller, so a fraction of these. We have another bracket of nodes that are neighbors to the nodes that are controlled by the B controller, so sort of our first line of defense. And we have all the rest of the nodes. So we put nodes into these three brackets and then basically um, had a look at the voting dynamics um, for this simple type of mean field model, uh, which we then um, solved. We could solve the optimization problem for this case as well. And of course, it's just an approximation of what um, is really going on. But roughly, um, the model captures what's going on quite well. Uh, so these are a couple of figures that compare um, what you would get by simulation by just um, basically um, numerically um, solving the model and um, using greater descent to solve the maximization problem <coughs> and compared to our analytical um, solutions to this model as well. Yeah, you see that roughly I mean, things kind of tend to agree fairly well. There's a couple of differences which is not unexpected because clearly what you have seen previously is that the um, allocations tend to spread out um, with fairly long tails whereas our simple simplification of this only captures um, one layer of um, neighbors around the um, b control node in here. Yeah? But um, what the model actually captures quite well is this um, transition between um, sh uh, shadowing and not shadowing. Yeah? So in these figures here, what I show you is um, the optimal um, influence that is being allocated to the, a control, uh, to the b control node. So this is a b, that's a blue curve. What you have on the um, x-axis um, is typically um, is the ratio of the budget. So this ranges from um, A being budget superior to the situation where A is um, budget inferior. And um, I also plot in these figures um, what the um, optimal allocations to all the other classes of nodes are. So to the neighbors of the um, um, B controlled node and to the rest of all of the nodes. Yeah? And what you see is clearly here there is a um, sort of a transition point between a regime where roughly A has um, is budget um, superior to B, where you focus on um, shadowing that node, to a regime where you go over to the regime where you shield. Yeah. So we have put most of your influence basically on the name of the <coughs> node. Yeah. So this model already captures um, what's going on in this situation. Um, it's however um, for fairly um, low densities of the B controller, and it doesn't capture everything because it doesn't really capture um, the various layers of influence because we only have three classes of nodes in the model. Okay. So roughly, what we try to want to make out of this is there's two strategies, um, two heuristics that are also quite important, apart from the degree of the nodes that you would target, and um, what matters is um, that you would shadow if you are budget superior, or you would shield if you are mostly shield if you are budget inferior in comparison to your opposing controller. Oh, yeah. yep. and when you are shadowing, do you actually allocate more budget than the uh, other controller? Or yes, you do. You so do. you have so much more you can allocate yes, you have that node, and you have some left over. And you have some left over. Exactly. So in that transition, yep. that takes it at exactly the point where the budget of B is equal to A, yep. do you already start to go full on 
Because you, you don't go fully on the uh, decontrolled mode, right? Because you don't go fully on the decontrolled mode. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> essentially, because your um, control is um, probabilistic, right? because it's subject to the voting dynamics. So you have a declining marginal utility of putting more on the load. So, so then my question is, at that point, is, is, uh, does that blue curve hit zero, or does it jump? Yes, so this, this hits zero, yeah. But then there is a part where you allocate less than, than the other controller to, to that node you're sharing, right? I'm sorry, I don't follow this. Well, th there, uh, there might be a situation where you are at, uh, where you are shadowing, but with less budget on that node than the P controller. Okay, so that might be the case. So I'm not. I haven't because otherwise you would need to jump from zero yes. to the right. level of yes, the you're, you're right. Um, so that there is. So I'm. There might be a situation. Where there must be a regime. Yes, there might be a regime where you put less on. So it's maybe something you should have a look at and understand about that. So, 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 so yep. you're not targeting the B control in that side. Yep. So you, you leave a hole of size one in size, right? Yes. So you target the immediate neighbors, but yes. they know it's that, right? Not the load itself. So why, why is that? So I don't understand this because you, suppose I have the B, the B control controls one node. Yep. And presumably the neighbors of that node are effectively also being controlled. <coughs> decontrolled to a weaker extent, right? Mm -hmm. Is they are the names of the main decontrol. Mm -hmm. So what what is the whole of size one and not the, the decontrol node and the most innermost layer and then another layer of something, right? Why is, it, uh, why is it only that node and not the immediate neighbors that I leave out? Well because that node is very, very hard to control because the B controller has a lot of influence in that node. And you can't you can't get <coughs> this but the B controller also has, also has some neighbors of that neighbor. control over the, um, so it has an indirect influence on the neighbors as well. Right. But this, this influence is less because this influence is basically given by the strength of the link from the B control node to these neighbors. Okay, but isn't that equivalent to a B controller with a lower budget somehow? It's equivalent to a B controller with a somewhat lower budget, but you can compete with this budget. So my question is, can you construct a situation where you leave a hole of size two or three. You have the same thing on the budget yes. somehow, and the coupling is possible, right? We haven't seen this. Um, it's a question I haven't thought about. It might be possible. Um, but I think essentially um, because the B controlled influence, so even let's say the B controller completely gets the load that he controls, right? he, he drives it exactly to the B state. Um, you still. Um, how the influence is being propagated is given by the strength of the link between the B-controlled node and the neighbor. Right? So there might be a situation, if you look at a very low budget for A, that potentially um, there might be a larger hole. Okay, so, so I think I know it's yeah, <laughs> we haven't thought about it, but yeah, maybe come back to you. So, so before I looked at the situation where the B controller was fairly sparse, um, now I look at the situation, what happens if the B controller is more dense? Mm -hmm. So um, we've looked here at um, not regular graphs, um, but at um, scale-free networks, so some model of a heterogeneous network. And what we've done is, um, so basically we have four panels here, then look at the situation where the A controller is um, budget inferior to the B controller, and we look at the situation where the A controller is budget and superior to the B controller. And we compare on the right and the left hand side between different heuristics for the B controller. So one heuristic where the B controller is inversely, inversely proportional to the degree, and one um, situation where the B controller is um, proportional to the degree. Yeah? So basically allocates influence that grows to the degree. Yeah? And what I'm doing, so the B controller is just indicated here, but it's set by an external, externally by the model. And what we have optimized is the reaction of the A controller, the optimal reaction of the A controller. Yeah? And you see, basically, again, this um, avoidance effect. So if the um, A controller is um, budget superior, then the B controller um, tends to avoid the um, A controller, um, the nodes that are controlled by the um, A controller. But we also see that these relationships look very linear. Yeah. So it seems to be the case that the um, 
response of the A controller to um, an allocation by the B controller is essentially um, a linear response um, to what the B controller is doing, yeah, which might be increasing or might be decreasing um, in tendency as a function of the A. Okay. When you allocate the budget to control some of the nodes, is this then in sort in a dynamical way so that A allocates some part of the budget here, then B allocates, then A allocates part of the remaining that? Or is that as in a static way? A static it's way. Static way. You allocate all the budget in the beginning. In a yes, it's way. done. So I, I'm not talking about this today. We have looked a bit at the, started to look at the dynamic situation. But at the moment, this is only and it's, it's basically given the entire time. Yeah, because this is optimization. Okay, so we've taken it a bit um, further and played around. So we haven't done, in this case, linear allocation of the A controller and uh, of the B controller, but we've just said what happens if the B controller um, follows a sign function in allocations as a function of degrees. So you see the B controller is just doing sign function, and what you see is just to support this argument that we just have a linear response. What the A controller do is doing as an optimal response to the sign function of B controller is basically a sign function as well, but with a certain shift. So this, this indicates it's just a linear response. Okay, so it turns out that we can actually um, calculate and understand this quite well. Yeah, so what we've done in the following is we've um, had a look at the mean field theory for that situation, where we um, basically um, developed um, a degree lumped mean field theory. Um, so what we did is we put all nodes of a certain degree into a bracket, and then we assume that these nodes are randomly mixed in the system, and all nodes of the same degree basically are in the same state. Well, it's just an approximation, but it turns out that we can understand what's happening in the system. Yeah? So again, just to recap, I wrote down on our, leaf, uh, our um, rate equations in the beginning, um, just recap what the stationary state condition is. If you have noise in the system, yeah, then I just um, develop my standard um, degree lamp mean field um, condition for this case. Yeah, and what I come up with is um, an equation for the sum over all of the stationary state probabilities of the nodes. Um, but it's a fairly messy um, equation which still contains the mean field, but we can express the mean field, of course, as a function of moments of the degree distribution and including um, the allocations of the control, which are the A and B controllers here. Yeah, so from the equation directly, you don't really see what is going on, but um, we can expand this equation in certain limits to basically see what happens in the high noise and in the low noise um, scenario of the setting. Yeah, so um, what we did is we basically had a look at the situation where um, the effect of the network is relatively large in comparison to the effect of the control. Yeah, so the budget ultimately of the A or the B controller are relatively small in comparison to the um, average degree of the network. Yeah, under these conditions, you look back here into this equation. Yeah, so if I make these assumptions about all of the individual controls, um, I can expand um, this equation as a function of A over K, um, essentially. Yeah, so it's just a standard exercise and takes a bit of time. Um, but the interesting situation is that if you go up to second order here, you come up with an optimization problem which you can just basically solve analytically. So this is what we've done. Um, so what I show you here is um, first the um, approximation, so the first um, order approximation for the case where noise is very large. So I presume that noise is larger than um, this factor A over K, which I'm um, developing um, the um, equation. Have a look at this equation. So you clearly see if you try to optimize your influence on what are the nodes that you should target. Yeah, you should target the nodes, um, so A and B only appear in this term here, so clearly you should go only for the nodes that have the lowest degree, yeah, because that maximizes that term here, and the other terms are not dependent on the degree um, specific allocations in this situation. Yeah. Moreover, for the setting, we also can read from the setting what the um, national equilibrium of the situation is, so if you want to simultaneously optimize um, A and B controllers, we see that both A and B controllers will in fact only target the lowest degree nodes um, in this situation. Okay, so let's take it um, a bit further and um, look at the situation where the amount of noise in the system is actually comparable to the term that we used for our expansion to A over K. Yeah, so I've expanded um, 
in this case as well, and I omit a couple of steps, you get an optimization problem, second like order than the connection itself. And so the first equation still um, contains the Lagrange multiplier, then I kick the Lagrange multiplier out for this situation. So we see for every allocation of the B controller, what the optimal response of the A controller should actually be on the setting. Yeah? So let's have a short look at this equation. First, for the setting without noise. Yeah? So let's um, <coughs> assume that Q is equal to zero. So if Q is equal to zero, um, this last term is going to drop out, this term is going to drop out. So I'm effectively left with this term BK times A minus B over 2B plus a offset term A plus B over 2. So what we see from this equation is exactly what I showed you in the simulations before, that the optimal response of the um, B controller, of the A controller to the B controller is just a linear response. You know, you're just doing whatever the B controller is doing times some factor plus some offset factor in there. Um, interestingly also, um, if you now include the noise as well, we see that there's actually a, a bias in the system against um, targeting higher degree nodes. So you see in the last term here that typically we would try, depending on the amount of noise, you would try to avoid the higher degree noise. So we can, I mean, this also shows that um, basically if you say there's no bias in the B controller, so if you were to assume that the B controller is uniform or random, um, the A controller doesn't have any incentive to go for high degree nodes. So what the A controller would do is it's just more or less um, spread its budget equal. So this shows that in the um, continuous allocation scenario, this is quite different from the um, allocation scenario for the binary control. So instead of just going for the hub nodes, what you do is you spread out your influence evenly over all the nodes in the system. Yeah. So also for that situation, we can actually calculate what the Nash equilibrium is, um, because we basically come up with analytical expressions for the utility of both of the controllers. Um, so looking at the um, Nash equilibrium there, so I've argued about the first case, about the high noise case um, already, which was very trivial to see just from the expansion of the um, Voltaire equation. Um, for the setting with small amounts of noise, we see that in the Nash equilibrium, actually, um, both of the noise tend to avoid high degree modes. Um, so because we have this um, K minus um, average degree times um, the amount of noise factor in the equations here. If we go to the setting where we avoid, or where we don't have any noise in it, tells us the Nash equilibrium for this control problem for the um, voting dynamics is basically just to spread your influence equally to all of the nodes. Yeah? So there's no degree preference in there um, at all. Yeah? Okay, so slightly different um, seems to point out that the heuristic of targeting high degree nodes um, is not necessarily um, a good heuristic in all of the settings. Yeah? So I'm realizing I'm getting short of time and I so the so, um, essential message I wanted to give about this talk is basically the message that um, targeting high degree loads is not necessarily a good idea depending on um, what slight uh, um, modification you have on the voting dynamics. Um, you might get very different heuristics um, that work much better. Yeah? Especially if you make um, the inference allocation problem continuous, then the optimal solution is certainly not to target in specific nodes, but rather to spread out your influence um, as uniformly as you can. Okay, so because I'm short of time, so I'm not going to talk much about the finite and time horizon scenario, but I'll just give you some answers to some of the questions that I posed in, in the beginning. So about the situation if you have noise, so I hope I'm, even so I messed it up in the beginning, I hope I convinced you that um, targeting hub nodes is not necessarily the best idea. You know, so if you have um, a situation with a lot of noise in the dynamics, it's difficult to control the system, but the best that you can do is to basically go for the periphery nodes. Yeah. Or um, if you have agent heterogeneity in um, the model, so if you make some nodes um, partial sealets, we can also come up with rules um, for what sealets you should actually target in the system. So it turns out this depends on your budget availability and the degree of salary of these nodes. So you always go for the low hanging fruit um, as long as your budget is sufficient. And this in, in brief, um, the answer to this. Um, what I spent most time on the continuous allocation um, scenario, so basically no preference for hub nodes in this scenario at all, um, because the continuous allocation makes it easier, so we can basically also calculate the national equilibrium but the national equilibria are fairly boring for the voting dynamics. 
So that might be an incentive to look at weight testing um, models of opinions back in the setting. Yeah? So game theory we can do. And what I didn't um, actually argue about, um, if we change that problem <coughs> from just optimizing what happens in equilibrium, we can also show that um, things change if you have a finite time horizon. So if you have a finite time horizon, so you don't necessarily have enough time to get to equilibrium, what you should do depends on your budget and on the size of the, um, of the distance of the time horizon. So basically, if the time horizon is far enough from you, you have enough time to conquer hub nodes in the system. So the heuristic is still that you should go for the hub nodes as it is in equilibrium in this situation. Um, if the time horizon, or as the time horizon becomes shorter and shorter, you have to go for lower and lower degree nodes. And so there's a continuous change that you go for from hub nodes for a long time horizon then you move on to um, nodes of lesser degree, and if the time horizon becomes very, very short, what you go for is just the periphery nodes. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. Um, right, so um, the end of my talk. So as a summary, um, the main message is um, there are some differences. If you change um, the rules slightly, the heuristic of just targeting high degree nodes um, may not work anymore. But there's also a lot of um, future work of things that we want to move on to and look at um, at the moment because we realize, of course, that the voting dynamics, um, the linear voting dynamics as we have used it here, is maybe not the most realistic model of um, contagion, influencing contagion. So we want to move on to nonlinear models here. That's one of the reasons why I'm here to talk to Maxi about um, some of these things. Okay, um, thanks. So I think that is fundamental to what you have done, if I understood correctly, is that the influenceability of a node is inversely proportional to the degree, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, which comes from the dynamical rules. Yep. But there is any evidence to that? So the people who have more connections, they are more difficult to influence, because I think there are two things that maybe are not correlated, right? Um, no. But I haven't, but I haven't looked at um, empirical evidence for this rule. Um, we've gone with the voting dynamics. It's true what you say. That, um, that's a modeling assumption, ultimately. Um, I have to look at um, variations of this assumption. Yes. So if I understand this correctly, if you basically write down sort of the last equation, the third equation, and then you, you solve for the session, and, yep. you, and you optimize this somehow numerically. Right? Yes. So well, so either mostly numerically, but for some situations. So, so how, how does this scale the number of nodes in the network in, in, in terms of computing time? In terms of computing time? Is that time? Really for larger? Yes, so this depends. So I've talked about the number of scenarios. Um, for the scenario of um, discrete allocations, um, this doesn't scale very well, because the algorithms that we have used are combinatorial um, optimization techniques. Um, in the case of the continuous allocations, this is quite easy to solve because we're essentially using gradient descent. So this scales very well and we can do it for very large networks. For the case of the discrete setting, um, I mean, I haven't pushed it to extremely large networks. We can do networks of maybe a um, thousand, maybe 10,000 volts, but then the quality of the solution is likely to suffer. So this is already using um, tricks to solve the linear equations um, with numerical um, approximation techniques instead of solving exactly. We have shown some the slides uh, with different types of networks, but you have any, is there any diff diff substantial difference mm -hmm. when using different types of networks, like Rosreni, uh, Barabasi, Albert, Regular, is there, or everything works for every type of network? So the, te what we, the optimization techniques work for yeah, but, but all types of networks, right? It's different, it is the tariff versus the no, the is the same this is the same. Uh, this is the same. Yeah. So, so yeah. I think this is partly because, what you said, um, the voting dynamics is a fairly simple model in the end. So it's also what you see in the Nash equilibria that we have calculated. It doesn't look very interesting because it's either there's no noise, it's saying um, just spread your influence um, basically um, uniformly over the entire network. It doesn't matter what the structure of the network is. Um, or if we have a bit of noise in the system, 
it's basically saying, okay, try to have a slight bias against the nodes of a higher degree. There doesn't seem to be much difference. There might be something interesting and some differences in there in the situation um, of the um, low density of the B controller. So this is a situation where we don't have a very good analytical handle there. So, so you make an expansion that looks as uh, inverse of power of K and yes, power so ranges. This so is that's when this yes, so, so of, course, is that be of course, in the analytical um, argument that I presented, there's an assumption in there that things only depend on the grid. But if you look at the numerical data, we haven't seen much deviation from this, um, depending on the type of network that we look at. But the the was was right? Right? Yes, yeah, so if you correlate them, that will make a difference. So this is something we are working on. Um, if you correlate them strongly, so if you introduce, for instance, strong assertivity, this will make a difference. Um, or if you cluster them strongly, um, this might make a difference as well. So, yes, most of the networks that I had in the figures are basically random. Yeah. Yeah. In, in a practical case, if you don't know what is the budget of the order, <coughs> you don't know how do you target the, the, the noise? And, you know, if you don't know if the noise is very noisy or not, can you infer that from some properties and then decide what to do? Or? Yes, in principle you can. So this is um, an issue that we are working on. Um, but to be fair, let's say first that most of the um, literature assumes that you know what the opponent is doing. But of course, this is not a realistic assumption. Um, what you can do against it, um, to some extent, is you can play the Nash equilibrium. If you say, I don't have any idea of what the opponent is doing, the best that you can do is the Nash equilibrium, which is fairly trivial in this case. Um, or you need to think about methods of figuring out something about your opponent. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something we are thinking about, we are working on, but I can't present any results about that. But really important question. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, um, yeah, the Nash equilibrium was kind of boring. Um, so is, is, uh, what are your ideas to make more interesting scenarios? Well, we want to go beyond the voting dynamics. Um, so at the moment, um, we think the, the simple Nash equilibrium basically comes out of the linearity of the voting dynamics. Um, so we want to look at um, the case when we introduce non-linearity there. Yeah, fairly sure that we we'll change things, um, but we have to see. You mentioned heterogeneity at the beginning. Yes. Would you the, the Nash equilibrium? Um, so it's something we haven't. Okay, so if you introduce, we have introduced heterogeneity in terms of um, susceptibilities of nodes to opinions, so ultimately a bias for nodes to opinions. Um, we have started to look at this, um, but we haven't calculated Nash equilibrium on this setting yet, because the um, the expansion becomes slightly more difficult, um, so I'm not in a position yet to tell you what happens there. But it will change things for sure, so this is what I can say, because the Nash equilibrium is going to be a function of degree and sustainability of the nodes. Any further questions? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready to run away from this topic, but uh, I've been recently reading about the quadratic voting yeah. and all these techniques to avoid some. Um, um, that influencer. So, have you been thinking of expanding? Maybe noisy is related with quad quadratic voting, but I don't see the connection. No, I don't see it. But how do you feel you are quadratic voting, for example, or other kind of techniques can change your main results? I think because the, then the, the nodes, it's a bit more sophisticated, right? Yes, clearly. Um, have you tried to expand this, adding more complexity to the nodes? or? We have a bit in terms of adding susceptibilities, what we just discussed. Yes. Um, we haven't moved beyond the linear voting um, at the moment. You know, so this is a plan for the future. Um, because the nature is very different. So you get domains, so things might be very different, I think. But we thought, I mean, OK, so we are, we are clearly aware that the voting dynamics is not the best model for realistic contagion. But we thought we should understand what happens in the linear model first um, before moving on to, to the more realistic case, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is no further question. We will stop here. Um, if anyone is interested to talk to Marcus either this afternoon or tomorrow morning, let me know on the